The Bible consists of 66 books. The Old Testament contains 39, and the New Testament contains 27. I hope that that is not news to anybody that's here. Okay, I hope that you, you, you know those facts and those figures. But have you ever stopped to wonder why those 66 books and not others? You know, uh, what about the additional books that Catholic versions of the Bible contain as part of the Old Testament? And what about the so-called, quote-unquote, lost books of the Bible that the History Channel is so good about producing specials on to try and persuade people not to believe the rest of the Bible because these lost books of the Bible were excluded from it? Uh, books like the, the Gospel of Thomas and others. You know, why, why aren't they included while others are? Well, such questions can pertain to the canonicity of the Bible. Now, the word canon is not referring to a large gun, okay? The word canon, as we're using it, uh, means a rule or standard for anything. For early Christians, it meant the rule of faith what is accepted as authoritative scripture. The inclusion of any book into the canon follows two basic steps. The first is inspiration by God. God determined the canon by co-authoring uh, the book in a manner of speaking. Uh, God inspired the ones who were writing, and, and so that's why it is included, is because of that. A second step is recognition by man. Man recognized what God revealed and accepted it as the canon, as authoritative. Now, one uh, scholar who uh, deals with that type of thing on a regular basis was quoted as saying, A book is not the word of God because it was accepted by the people. It was accepted by the people because it was the Word of God. So we need to make sure we keep those steps in order. Inspired by God and accepted by people as the canon. That explains very little though as far as our question, our desire to know why these 66 books that are in here and not others. That, uh, that, that some people say should be included. Well, let's consider the question first as it relates to the Old Testament or the Hebrew canon as it is called. The Hebrew canon was recognized by Jesus. Since it was recognized by Jesus, anyone who accepts the authority of Jesus will accept what he acknowledged as Scripture. Uh, Jesus says, if Jesus acknowledges it as Scripture and we acknowledge the authority of Jesus, then therefore we, by uh, that declaration of Jesus' authority, we accept it as well because he did. Uh, he pointed to the Scriptures. Passages such as John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40. He says, You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. He also spoke about the faithfulness of scriptures. Uh, in passages such as John 10 verse 35. Where Jesus himself makes the statement. Scripture cannot be broken. Now it's important to understand. That when Jesus made that statement. The only scripture that was accepted and in existence was what we have as the Old Testament. Jesus also recognized three major divisions of the Old Testament, uh, which included 39 books, uh, uh, conveniently. The three sections are the law, or the Torah as it's known, which is Genesis through Deuteronomy, the books of Moses as they are known. Uh, the second section was the prophets. Uh, in, the, in the prophets there are uh, two sections, if you will. 
the former prophets, which are Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings. And there is the latter prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then in the latter prophets is another book containing the 12 minor prophets. So they put all the minor prophets together because they're minor, I guess. Uh, minor doesn't mean less important. So it just means that they uh, were shorter books, I guess. But they include them all as one uh, in the latter prophets. So we've got the law, the prophets, and the writings. Uh, the writings contain a couple of sections as well. There is the uh, three poetical books, Psalms, Proverbs, and Job. Five roles, as they are called, uh, the Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, Esther, and Ecclesiastes, and several historical books, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and First and Second Chronicles. Jesus recognized those three divisions, and more than that, Jesus uh, followed the arrangement of the Old Testament books that was customary among the Jews. Uh, we see this in his comments in Luke chapter 11, verses 49 through 51, where Jesus says, Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, some, uh, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you that it will be required of this generation. Yes, yeah, wait, I said, what does that have to do with what we're talking about? Well, uh, here he speaks of the persecution of the prophets from the murder of Abel, Genesis chapter 4, to the slaying of Zechariah, recorded in 2 Chronicles 24, verses uh, 20 and 21, which Zechariah, that, that's like saying a, Abel to Zechariah is saying A to Z for the Hebrews. And that also corresponds to the uh, Jews as saying from Genesis to Malachi, the Old Testament canon, uh, although they don't have the book Malachi, but uh, you, you get what I'm saying. Uh, this arrangement is the one that is also followed by uh, the Hebrew Old Testament even today. Now, Wilbert R. Garwish, in his book, How the Canonicity of the Bible Was Established, says this, that Jesus does not quote from every book of the Old Testament. But he does quote from all three of the main divisions, showing that he accepted the entire Old Testament as canonical. Uh, again, you know, if, if he quotes from sections in the Old Hebrew canon, it shows that he accepted it as authoritative. In addition to being recognized by Jesus, though, the Hebrew canon was also recognized by the apostles. Uh, Paul acknowledged the Hebrew canon in his writings, such as in Romans 15, verse 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, and through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Uh, what was written in former days? He's talking about the Hebrew canon. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, he says, Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. And in 2 Timothy 3, verses 14 through 17, Paul tells the young evangelist Timothy, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings or scriptures uh, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. When Paul mentions sacred writings, when he mentions scriptures, he is making reference to the Hebrew canon because that was the only writings that were accepted as scripture 
when he wrote all scripture is breathed out by God. But not only that, the apostles frequently quoted from the Hebrew canon. In their gospels, those that were written, uh, Matthew is one who frequently quotes from the Hebrew canon, and not just when he's quoting what Jesus said, but even in his writing. Uh, of course, Matthew is a, one of the gospels that was written to the Jews, primarily. And that would make a lot of sense that he would draw on the Hebrew canon. Uh, in their efforts to evangelize, when uh, Paul goes to Thessalonica, Acts 17, verses 2 and 3 tell us that he would frequently discuss the Old Testament, the Hebrew canon, with, with them in the synagogues on the Sabbath. And in their letters, in the writings, uh, Paul frequently will, Peter will, and others uh, quote from the Old Testament and quote from the Hebrew canon. It is evident that Jesus and his apostles accepted the authority, the canon of the Hebrew scriptures, which included the 39 books of the Old Testament. But what about the extra books of the, that are found in the Catholic Old Testament? Those books are commonly referred to as the Old Testament Apocrypha. Now, you may not be very familiar with the Apocrypha, uh, and there's a good reason for that, and I'll share that with you a little bit later. But uh, let me just briefly try to describe for you what the Apocrypha is. The Apocrypha are a collection, is a collection of books that were written after Malachi. Malachi is the last Old Testament book, and it was written somewhere around 400 BC. They were written after Malachi, but before the coming of Jesus. Now, since, I don't know about you, but since I was, you know, wee tall, I've been in Bible class, and I've been taught that before, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there was 400 years that God was silent. Those who accept the Apocrypha as part of the canon would say that that was wrong. That, there, that God was not silent because the Apocrypha is God speaking during those 400 years. Well, these books include the Wisdom of Solomon, written somewhere around 30 BC. It's also known as the Book of Wisdom. Ecclesiasticus written in 132 B.C., also known as Sirach. Tobit, that was written in around 200 B.C. Judith, uh, 150 B.C. Uh, first and second Maccabees was written 110 B.C. The prayer of Azariah was written uh, 100 B.C. also. Um, but they placed the prayer of Azariah as Daniel chapter 3 verses 24 through 90. Now what they do with Daniel 3 24 through 30 in the Hebrew canon, I don't know. But they place it at that particular juncture. Uh, also, uh, Susanna was written 100 BC, is placed as Daniel chapter 13. In the Hebrew canon, Daniel has 12 chapters. And then placed as Daniel 14 is a little story published in 100 B.C. known as Bell and the Dragon. Um, Baruch, 150 to 50 B.C., somewhere in that time frame, is placed as Baruch 1 through 5. The letter of Jeremiah, 300 to 100 B.C., somewhere in that time frame, that actually is placed as Baruch chapter 6. There's also additions to Esther, 140 to 130 B.C., somewhere in that time frame, placed as, as, as Esther, chapter 10 through chapter 16, verse 24. First, Esdras, uh, 150 to 100 B.C., uh, also known as Third Ezra. Uh, second, Esdra, Esdras, uh, 150 to 100 B.C., known as Fourth es Ezra. And the prayer of Manasseh, written in 100 B.C. So that's, those are the 15 or so books of the, of the Old Testament Apocrypha. The, the Apocrypha was accepted as part of the canon 
uh, via the Council of Trent uh, in, uh, one, in 1546 uh, AD, okay? Uh, 1546, 1546 years after it changed from BC to AD, uh, they accepted it. Uh, but even as they accepted it, they had some questions. They accepted all of the Apocrypha with the exception of first and second Ezra, Esdras and the prayer of Manasseh. Now why didn't they accept those? Well, it seems that there's a teaching in second Esdras 7 verse 105 in opposition to prayer for the dead. By 1546, the Catholic Church had already begun praying for the dead. And so therefore they didn't want to accept that as, uh, as part of the, their canon. And so they just did away with second Esdras. And so they had to do away with first Esdras as well. And the prayer of Manasseh uh, was pretty closely related to that as well. Uh, now while there are 15 total books in the Apocrypha, if you happen to come upon a Roman Catholic Bible, you will find that the Apocrypha actually only contains 11 books because they take out those three. So 15 minus 3 is... What? 15 minus 3 is 12. And then they combine the letter of Jeremiah with Baruch, thus Baruch is 1 through 5, and the letter of Jeremiah is known as Baruch 6. So uh, they combine those two, so 12 minus 1 is 11, and that's how they come up with 11 uh, books in the Apocrypha. Now then, the reason some of these, uh, the, that these books were accepted as scripture, uh, some church fathers accepted these books, people like Arrhenius, Tertullian, uh, Clement of Alexandria. Now, even though they're respected as church fathers, please remember these were just men, okay? Uh, the Syriac church accepted them in the 4th century. The Eastern Orthodox Church accepts them as authoritative, as uh, canonical. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church proclaimed them as... Uh, um, as uh, as canonical in 1546. Uh, the Apocrypha was included in Protestant Bibles, some Protestant Bibles, but that would include the original 1611 King James Version of the Bible, included the Apocrypha. Uh, some were found among the other Old Testament books with the Dead Sea Scrolls. So some would say that that's a whole lot of evidence for the Apocrypha to be considered as uh, canonical. Um, however, while there are some reasons to accept the Apocrypha, I believe there are a whole lot more reasons to reject the Apocrypha as a part of Scripture. One of those reasons, and this is why you may not be very familiar with the Apocrypha, is because there are so many reasons why it shouldn't be considered part of the Old Testament. Uh, one of those would be that Jesus and his apostles do not accept or did not accept them as scripture. How do we know that Jesus and his apostles did not accept them as scripture? Well, there are no New Testament references to any of the Apocrypha as being authoritative. None. Uh, the New Testament writers never actually quote the Apocrypha. They quote the Hebrew canon frequently. Jesus and his apostles quoted the, uh, uh, the Hebrew canon frequently, but they never quote the Apocrypha. Had to be a reason for that. The reason is they didn't accept them as authoritative, as scripture. Uh, also, Judaism never accepted these books as part of the scripture. Now, why is that so important? Why is it so important that the Jews did not accept the Apocrypha. Well, think about it. Who is God's chosen people from Abraham to the end of the Old Testament? The Jews. The Jews were the ones who were in possession of Scripture. If they didn't accept the Apocrypha, 
then, then we understand that, that, that the Apocrypha could not have been authoritative. Uh, in fact, ancient Jewish leaders specifically rejected the Apocrypha. Uh, Josephus, uh, Philo, among others. And while it is included in the Septuagint, which is the Greek Old Testament, uh, they were never accepted as part of the canon. In fact, in the New American Bible, the New American Bible is the Catholic translation of the Bible, in a footnote to the story of Susanna and Bell and the Dragon, it frankly admits they are excluded from the Jewish canon of Scripture. Now, while a few early church leaders appear to take some material from them, <coughs> excuse me, most were opposed to the inclusion of the Apocrypha in the canon of Scripture. Uh, people like uh, Athenius, uh, Cyril of Jerusalem, Jerome, and Origen, and other early leaders, some, as I said, some accepted them, but the majority did not. Uh, also, the Apocrypha itself, Internal evidence recognizes our Old Testament canon as distinctly, or as a distinct 24 books which corresponds to the Hebrew Bible as it is known today. You say, wait a second, where'd 24 come from? Well, remember, they, the Hebrew canon combines 15 books into one book, and so we, we come from, down from 39 to uh, 24. Uh, in, in second uh, Ezra 14 verses 44 through 48, 70 books are distinguished from 94, leaving 24, or the exact number of the Hebrew canon, which when we separated all the minor prophets into their own books, became 39 books. I know that's a lot of numbers. You were told there'd be no math, weren't you? Okay, well anyway, <clears throat> not only does the Apocrypha not claim inspiration for itself, it actually disclaims inspiration. Uh, it disclaims describing an existing cessation of, prop uh, of prophecy in 1 Maccabees chapter 9, verse 27. So the Apocrypha says that prophecy had ceased. And yet some people say no prophecy hadn't ceased because we have the Apocrypha. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? But uh, that's, that's just the way it is. Uh, not only that, but the Apocrypha includes unbiblical teaching, such as praying for the dead. Uh, 2 Maccabees 1246 uh, or 45b, depending on the translation of the Apocrypha that you have, uh, teaches about, uh, about praying for the dead. And remember, the Catholics didn't accept three specific books of the Apocrypha because it taught against praying for the dead. So the Apocrypha teaches prayer for the dead, and it teaches no prayer for the dead. Does that sound like our scriptures? issuing contradictory statements. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, they, not only that, they contain demonstrable errors. Uh, one example, Tobit. Okay, Tobit was supposedly alive when Jeroboam led his revolt. That's the revolt against Rehoboam, who was the son of Solomon, and it resulted in the divided kingdom. Tobit was supposedly alive when that happened, around 931 BC. Tobit was also uh, still living at the time of the Assyrian captivity, which happened 722 BC. Thus, Tobit lived at least 209 years. That's the time frame between 931 and 722. Okay, and not only that, it, it, that's just bare minimum how old he had to be because he had to have been a, at an age where he could remember things at the time of Rehoboam plus at the time of the Assyrian captivity. Yet the book of Tobit says that he lived only 158 years. 
And that's Tobit 1, 3 through 5, and Tobit 14, verse 11, in case you want to check that in your copy of the Apocrypha, that, that I'm sure all of you have at home, right? Okay. Uh, so anyway, that's just one example of demonstrable errors in the Apocrypha. Uh, the first official adoption of the Apocrypha by the Roman Catholic Church came at the Council of Trent, which was in 1546, 1,500 years after it was written. So for those 1,500 years, we didn't have everything we needed. Well, yeah, actually we did. But uh, anyway, uh, when the Apocrypha first appeared in Protestant Bibles, the manner of its inclusion is, uh, it, it calls it into question. It was normally placed in a separate section since it was not considered of equal authority. In fact, Martin Luther included the Apocrypha in his German Bible, but he introduced them with this comment. These are books that are not to be considered the same as Holy Scripture and yet are useful and good to read. So I guess Luther thought maybe, you know, they're, 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 you can read them if you want to, but, but they're not Scripture. You, know, you can read them if you have some spare time, want some entertainment, whatever, but they're not Scripture. In fact, there is no Greek manuscript that contains the exact collection of the books of the Apocrypha as accepted by the Council at Tr of Trent. Um, now then, while the Syrian church accepted the Apocrypha in the 4th century, okay, that's considerably before 1546 with the Council of Trent, but while the, the Syrian church accepted the Apocrypha in the 4th century, the translation of the Bible into Syrian in the second century did not include it. It was in existence, but it didn't include it. It was, wasn't until the fourth century that the Syrians uh, accepted it. And finally, the Qumran community, which uh, is, a, is an ancient civilization that had, some, had its... Um, um, home in the West Bank region of, the, uh, of uh, Palestine. Uh, now it's an archaeological site, a very uh, prominent, very rich with artifact uh, archaeological site. But the Qumran community had hundreds of books in its library beyond Scripture. But the, and the library had some of the Apocrypha, it did not have commentaries on the Apocrypha like it did on the Old Testament books, on the Hebrew canon books. Not only that, the Old Testament books that were in that library were written in a special script on special parchment that the Apocrypha was not written on. The uh, Qumran uh, clearly considered the Apocrypha to be different from Scripture. So while the Apocrypha of the Old Testament may be of historical value and in some ways supplement God's truth, they are not canonical. They're not. Uh, those who accept the authority of Jesus and his apostles will be content with those books that are found in the Hebrew Old Testament. But you know, in one sense, the issue is pretty much could be regarded as irrelevant. Because the Apocrypha relates to the Old Testament. Christians are under the New Testament, the New Covenant of Christ, not the Law of Moses. Romans 7, 6, Galatians 5, 4, other passages speak about the Old Law passing away. Therefore, we are to be devoted to the apostles' teaching, like Acts 2.42 says the first century church was. So it doesn't matter if the Apocrypha is part of the Old Testament or not, because we don't follow the Old Testament. Do you know, that kind of raises another question. What about the canonicity of the New Testament? Come back next week and we'll talk about that. <laughs> How's that for a tease? The point is, 
The scriptures tell us that God has made sure that we have everything we need for life and godliness. And it's all found right here. We don't need extra books. We don't need additional books. We just need what's found in here. If we will follow the plan that he gives, then we will um, have all that we need for life and godliness. Part of what we're taught is that if we're going to be considered faithful, we have to serve faithfully. If you haven't been serving faithfully, now is a perfect opportunity to begin to start serving faithfully. Maybe what you need to do is simply just pray where you're at. Maybe you need to make a public response. But whatever that response is, don't leave here before you've made that response. And if we can help you in some way through a public response to make things right between you and God, then won't you let us know by coming to the front as we stand and sing.